Good evening. Welcome, everyone. This is Winter Jazz Fest. Sadly, we can't, of course, all be together, but it's a pleasure to have you all here. And of course, during these interesting and momentous times, it's really vital that we can all come together and discuss such uh, pertinent issues, uh, keep the conversation going. Uh, the jazz and gender conversation is something we started several years ago, and we're thrilled to partner with uh, the new school, uh, Jazz Contemporary Music. Uh, department and uh, Berkeley uh, Jazz and Gender Studies, uh, Jazz, Gender and Justice Studies. Um, we have an incredible panel for you this evening. Um, I just want to uh, say that, you know, again, throughout you all, you all can be here today. We miss your faces. We miss all the musicians, the venues, the energy and the hang in person. And for continuity's sake, we're proud uh, we can all come here together today. We are committed to bringing uh, everyone together to expand the jazz community, to have these vital conversations, showcase voices uh, digitally because we have to, and not in person. And uh, we hope that uh, together we can create impactful messaging that lives beyond uh, the, the squares on our screen. And we do intend to come back together in person next year. Um, I also want to mention that Winter Jazz Fest um, helped launch and supports the Jazz Coalition. Um, early in, in the early days of the pandemic, we launched the Jazz Coalition to raise money and give commission grants to deserving musicians um, to create new work in response to these uh, challenging times. Uh, to date, we've given out 100 commissions to deserving artists, and we hope to give out more. So if you'd like to support us so we can support the creation of new work, uh, go to jazzcoalition.org. Um, the programming uh, continues this month uh, and into next month. Uh, you can go to winterjazzhost.com to see all upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow through Sunday, we're happy to launch uh, a conversation series called Jazz Nerds, featuring Layla Hathaway in conversation with special guests. Uh, she will be speaking with Robert Glasper and Terrace Martin and uh, Amber Navran from the band Moonchild uh, on each uh, Friday, uh, sorry, yeah, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So come back and join us. And uh, again, I want to thank all the participants, everyone behind the scenes who made this happen. Uh, and without further ado, I wanna pass the mic over to musician, composer, educator, and my neighbor, Sarah Elizabeth Charles. That's true, Bryce. We are neighbors. I forget. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, thanks, Bryce. And hey, everybody. Hello, everyone at home. Um, I just wanted to welcome you to the second Jazz and Gender Talk Series event. Um, this, this event is called Jazz, Gender, and Black Feminism, What We Can Learn. Um, and I wanted to invite everyone throughout the course of this event, whether you're watching on the webinar or on the Facebook Live pages, um, one of the Facebook Live pages, please feel free to comment and to ask questions throughout the course of the event tonight. Um, I will be fielding questions both from the Facebook Live chats and from the webinar chats throughout the course of the event. And we'll, we're gonna welcome or we're gonna open up space for responses and for, for questions specifically in the middle of the event and then also toward the end of the event. Um, today's talk, as I said, will be the second of three conversations around jazz and gender that are going to be taking place or that have taken place already over the months of January, February, and March of 2021. And I just wanted to take a moment to give just a little bit of context as to how we got here. Um, Winter Jazz Fest has been centering talk series events around jazz and gender, as Bryce pointed out, for the past three years. And many different participants from many different backgrounds and realms of experience have participated. This year, though, is the very first year that we've had an opportunity to have more than one conversation. We have three conversations centered on gender during this talk series. Uh, I wanted to, to just upfront say thank you to Bryce for that and for, to Nyama, Sandy, and all of our partners for that as well. Um, everybody's been working really hard to make this happen, um, including also all of our participants. And uh, a special thanks also today to Naomi Extra, who has played a really large part in specifically imagining our event today and continuing these conversations around black feminism and uh, black feminist ideology and what we can learn and what, how we can borrow from that ideology and learn um, and grow our communities and keep moving our communities forward as it relates to not only gender relations, but just relations in general. 
Um, so in saying this, I just wanted to take a second too to introduce our partners a little bit more specifically. Uh, so our first partner, the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music at the College of Performing Arts at the New School is both my alma mater and where I currently work as an adjunct professor. Uh, at the School of Jazz, we've been working to develop both the Jazz and Gender course with my counterpart, Caroline Davis, as well as the Jazz and Gender series for four years now um, in an effort to provide a space for productive conversations uh, around gender and Black American music. Um, the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music and the College of Performing Arts started partnering with Winter Jazz Fest on the Jazz and Gender series in uh, the spring of 2020. Um, and we're really happy to be doing it again this year. Uh, our second partner, the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, was founded in 2018 by Terry Lynn Carrington. Um, specifically, the Institute seeks to engage in the pursuit of jazz without patriarchy and in making a long lasting cultural shift in jazz and other music communities, recognizing the role that Black American music can play in the larger struggle for gender and racial justice and equity. The Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice is the first of its kind and we're really grateful to have them as a second partner or a third partner for the curation of this series and for the conversations moving forward. Uh, so I'm talking a lot and I'm grateful to not be talking a lot today and to have an opportunity to take a, a seat, a back seat today um, and talk much less, but I do have one more really important introduction um, before I bow out. Um, I'm beyond excited to introduce a performance studies scholar, Dr. Tabitha Chester, as our moderator this evening. Um, in their work, Tabitha specializes in focusing on gender, sexuality, and religion in the Black diaspora. Their research uses both popular culture and the lived experiences of Black people to explore the development and performance of sexual and gender identities. In 2019, Tabitha co-founded Earthseed Artist Collective as a way to curate space for theater making, critical dialogue and collaboration. Currently, Tabitha is on faculty at both the New School and Florida Atlantic University. I'm honored, beyond honored. We just met this week for the very first time um, and I'm honored to be able to introduce Tabitha and to give them an opportunity to contextualize today's conversation around black feminism. So Tabitha, are you there? Hello. Hello. Hello and goodbye. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Thanks for being here. Thank you so much, Sarah, for that introduction. Um, like Sarah said, we recently met, I think, uh, a week ago in the inbox and actually um, virtually uh, through Zoom on Tuesday. So it's been a fast friendship. Um, and so me and Sarah had some conversations about how she envisioned this event, how she envisioned my role in it. Um, and I thought, thought a lot about the title of the event, right? What can we learn from Black feminism? I thought it was really important to maybe even just throw some definitions out there, or put some, some things in context. I know you really want to listen to your panelists. I'm just going to talk just a little bit to you. And I think some people are, a growing number of people are familiar with maybe feminism, right? The theory, the political, economic, and social equality of the sexes. Um, this is something that's, you know, been made famous in things like Beyonce songs, right? People might not have the same familiar familiarity with Black feminism, right? And I will argue, and many people argue, that Black feminism came before feminism. Uh, Black women have always had to consider their race and gender and their analysis and their lived experience since they came to this country. And so when I think about what we can learn from Black feminism, I go back to the statement of the Combehi River Collective in 1977. I just want to read um, just a part of it to you. Uh, the most general statement of our politics at the present time will be that we're actively committed to struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression and see as our particular task, the development of integrating analysis and practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppressions are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppression create the conditions of our lives. As black women, we see black feminism as a logical political movement to combat a manifold and simultaneous oppression that all women of color face. And so digging into that particular um, definition, me and Sarah created some questions that we wanted to ask the, the panel. This statement, this, uh, this statement was actually one of the first places we ever um, seen the term interlocking oppression in, um, in writing. 
And so when we think about interlocking oppression, we're thinking about the multiple forms of oppression that Black women face throughout their lives and daily, and how those things merge in their identities and are compounded in their lived experiences. And so understanding when we're coming from analysis of how we can think through jazz and make jazz more equitable, we have to think about the multiple levels of oppression that people face within um, by their identity, Black women, people of color, undocumented people, et cetera, et cetera. For me, it's really important for me to look to the ancestors and think through the ways that they combat these, some of these same issues that we're facing today. Um, and so fighting against erasure, Remembering those who came for us are Black feminist practices that give us a frame of work to reclaim and remember the people that came before us and forgotten from history, as well as re-looking at figures, our institutions and movements that we think we know, but through a lens that interrogates the sexism, classism, heterosexism, and the multiple system of oppressions um, that are operating within those institutions, in those stories, in those figured lives. So this could be re-examining um, a figure like Billie Holiday, right? That we have often get, get a very patriarchal, um, one-dimensional story of this really complex um, legend. Our questions also deal with anti-capitalism, we want to frame this conversation in a way that we can rethink our relation to productivity and production, right? How do we change the way we think of, uh, of claiming things? This is mine. This is my work. No one else. How do we how do we share the low? How do we share responsibility? How do we share art? And how do we also make sure we are paying Black people, paying people for their labor, and not just really taking taking um, advantage of them? A important part of our conversation also centered on the idea of like getting free, right? So one, one important tenet of Black feminist ideology is prioritizing, prioritizing the most marginalized and the most vulnerable in society. How do we reorganize our society, our organizations, our family, our different structure to be based on the needs of the most oppressed? So this means rethinking hierarchies, rethinking norms that we're giving, creating models that actually allows non-binary people, trans people, uh, undocumented people, disabled people to flourish. Um, and really rethinking again, who we prioritize within these movements and within um, our art forms. One of the movements that we're probably most familiar with in this day and age, it's been called the most successful social movement of all time, uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and one of the things that a lot of Black Lives Matter activists um, got from Black feminist framework is the idea of collaboration um, in a decentralized approach. Um, and so creating room for building power and nurturing power and rooms full of leaders that allow all of our identities to inform how we organize, um, looking for leaderful mo movements, leaderful, um, leaderful models for success, rather than often this one centralized leader or one charismatic um, artist, thinking again, who, we, who do we bring to the top? How does racism, classism, colorism, all of those effects, the music we listen to, the people who get contracts, people who um, are able to play in jazz halls. And so these are just some of the questions and things that we're gonna be dealing with today in, in the class, not class, this is my class, I'm so used to teaching class, um, in this conversation. So enough about me, I want to introduce um, our panelists. Our first panelist is, did it, and so when I when I say your name, we're just gonna do like a reveal and then you can take off your camera. Our first panelist is Asia Burrell Wood. Asia is the managing director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Uh, she oversees the day-to-day -day operation of the Institute and collaborates with founder and artistic director, Terry Lynn Carrington, on developing curriculum programs and initiatives in addition to teaching courses related to gender and justice in jazz and curating events among other duties. Uh, she's originally from Detroit, Michigan. Wood is an ethnomusicologist, educator and curator with a background development in violin performance. She has taught courses on music history and culture in the City University of New York, City College, Brooklyn College Conservative Music. Her works include research on musical community among Black classical musicians, women in jazz, jazz in the digital era, 
music and civil engagement in Harlem and other related genres in the African diaspora, such as blues, hip hop, soul, and West African traditions. She's been a visiting fellow at the New School in addition to her role as guest lecturer at New York University and various institutions throughout New York City. She was formerly Director of Operation for the Gate Pass Entertainment and has been the Associate Director for Special Projects and Public Engagement for Winston Marcellus Enterprises. She has curated performances for the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture for the annual Women Jazz Festival. She has also served as an arts presenting consultant and thought partner for Harlem Stage, We Still Heritage Center, Revive Music Group, and the Sphinx Organization. Our second panelist is Toshi Reagan, described by Vibe Magazine as one hell of a rock and roll, one hell of rock and roller coaster ride, and by Pop Matters as a treasure waiting to be found. Toshi Reagan is a one woman celebration of all that's dynamic, progressive, and uplifting in American music. Since first taking the stage at age 17, this versatile singer, songwriter, guitarist, has moved audience of all kinds with her big hearted, whole nothing back approach to rock, blues, R&B, country, folk, spirituals, and funk. The New York Times described her as a blend of love of mixing things, her vocal style ranging from a dirty blues moan to a gospel shout to an ethereal croon. Her live performances in particular aren't just accessible, they're irresistible. And Toshi Reagan loves her audience, leading her renowned band Big Lovely, launched in 1996. She instantly connects, inspires, and empowers. Over, over nearly 30 years, Reagan has collaborated with top innovators across the wide spectrum of the entertainment field. Since Lenny Kravitz chose her straight out of college to open for him on his first world tour, she has gone on stage with notable colleagues such such as Nana Hendrix, Elvis Costello, and Andy DeFranco, P. Stig, Seeger, Dara Williams, Liz Wright, and Michelle Inigo Cello. And Mark Thompson, Anthony Thompson, her performance with her mother, Bernice Reagan Johnson, a civil rights activist of the acapella group Sweet, Honey in the Rock, are legendary. Darius Jones. Darius has created a recognizable voice as a cr critical acclaimed saxophonist and composer by embracing individuality, innovation, and the tradition of African-American music. Jones has been awarded the Van Leer Fellowship, Jerome Foundation Commission, Jerome Artist in Residence at the Roulette French American Jazz Exchange Award, and in 2019, the From Music Foundation Commission at Harvard University. Jones has released a string of diverse recordings featuring music and images evocative of Black futurism. His work as a new co music composer for voice culminate, culminated in a major debut performance at Carnegie Hall in 2014. Jones had collaborated with artists such as Gerald Cleaver, Olive Lake, William Parker, Andrew Cyril, uh, Craig Ta Taborn, Wet Ink Ensemble, and many, many more. Um, in 2018, Dar Darius premiered across the United States, a major new composition entitled Law and Order, Law, Law and Order, a dramatic commentary on social justice and American politics. Jones' music is a confrontation against ap apathy and ego, hoping to inspire authenticity that compels us to be better humans. All right, everybody has their camera on. Everybody wave, say hello. Hi. <laughs> All right, I'm going to ask our first question. This first question is for everyone. Um, I think we talked a little bit about how we come to Black feminist principle. I was talking to Asia and I was saying, I think I knew, <laughs> I knew more about the practice before I knew the name, right? So feminism growing up was a dirty, a dirty word. You don't be a feminist, you Black feminist. But actually understanding what I saw in my parents and my mother and, and the women around me, I saw Black feminist practice. So I really are, is, I'm really interested in how have Black feminist practices helped to inspire and inform the spaces that you help create. So this can be musically, educationally, however you want to do it. Um, okay, so I mean, if I want to talk, start from how I come to it. And that's you know one of the first parts of that question, and I really appreciate it because I've been thinking about this a lot um, in 
in the work that I do, but also, you know, in thinking about the conversation that we were um, going to have today. And also, first of all, thank you um, for your wonderful introduction. And thank you to Sarah, Bryce, and um, the New School and Winter Jazz Fest for continuing to hold these spaces for us to have these dynamic conversations. Um, you know, yes, I'm from Detroit, very proud Detroiter. Um, and anybody who knows me knows that. And so I can't, I'm coming up in a, you know, uh, a highly musical city in a very black city, like the blackest city um, in America. And um, so coming into black feminism, you know, for me is coming through community first, right? And I really appreciate, you know, what you are saying in that, like, um, and, and, and I do remember some people treating feminism or that word you know, as a dirty kind of word or it's a controversial word while they, even though they were acting and moving in not just black fe feminism, but black feminism. And so my first thought is like, okay, well, my mom, the women, the black women who raised me um, and the generations of uh, black women of which I come from. And I think about the ways that, you know, a, a, a lot of what's happening in those formative years too is Black women imparting to me as a little black girl, right, ways um, in, in which, you know, one would have to navigate through these um, points of, you know, this point of intersection, right? And um, so that is very, that is very much coming early. I was raised also around black educators, um, also women who are very active in the community through churches, through organizations, um, black sororities, and I don't, I don't think we, connect that sometimes to black feminism, but absolutely our black sororities are shaped by framers of black feminism um, as well. And so this was my normal, um, this was my environment at the, um, at the same time did not have this language. I don't, I, you know, I, I, would, I don't recall it, you know, walking around thinking about it in those terms or having that language for it. Um, but there's something that there is definitely intrinsically understood and also in part on you because you, these black women who are raising me know that I have to walk through the world first as a black girl, a black girl, and then um, eventually as a black woman. So um, a lot of those lessons, a lot of that uh, thinking just and in a lot of the way they move their lives. And then of course, later on and through education and, um, and study, you know, you, you, I come to the framework, I come to the scholars, the activists, the artists um, who have been the articulators, who are the framers. And it's like, oh, okay, that's kind of what we've been, and maybe I've been experienced the whole time or what I've seen, but then eventually, um, you know, are able to have the language for that. And I think I also benefited from, um, you know, being in a black community, going to school in the black community with black women educators and in that, um, and, and all of the intellectual work that had happened previously so that, you know, for example, black women authors, you know, that, you know, Zora Neale Hurston, that Toni Morrison, um, that, you know, Maya Angelou, that Nikki Giovanni would have been in my curriculum. I didn't think about how powerful that was, you know, until maybe, you know, later on in life and not as in like, as a part of Black History Month or, um, you know, for a couple weeks uh, in English class, like this was the expectation and this was a standard. So I hope that answers that part. And so therefore I'd say in um, the work that I do and the work that we do at Jazz and Gender Justice at, um, in Ber um, at Berkeley and our institute is very much informed by black feminist thought. It is founded by a um, black woman and, you know, and, and, and this is our work and in, in our contribution um, here in that in that work, but it does it's not able to exist without all of that that comes uh, before. But it's absolutely informed, and I'm um, glad to. I'm not glad why we need to be doing this work. Let me be clear, <laughs> but I'm glad that we are able to do so, and um, and also able to do so now, in, in hopes of moving the culture forward, and um, you know, and making these lasting cultural, structural changes. I uh, think she, Darius, um, would like to jump in on a question. Yeah. 
you know, it's Zoom, so it's it's better if you pick people because we 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 can just be talking gotcha. all over each other. Um, I just want to, you know, start by paying um, so much respect and love for uh, Chick Corea, um, who is on his his um, next journey. Um, I didn't want to go too much further without mentioning that. And um, uh, to the question, uh, you know, Asia, thank you so much for that answer because it just it, it covers a lot of ground. Um, but I would just say, like, to the notion of of naming things and to and 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 generationally, like how things are named. Um, I, you know, uh, black black women. Um, I I know I, I'm resistant to anything that would try to put me into a particular box, um, because the expansiveness of black womanness is so wide that it's like, you know, would you call me, you know? So while I do love um, the uh, black black feminism and and black feminists, I can really understand that um, I can really understand at certain eras where that language just didn't meet actually the task at hand, um, it, and that the task at hand and the innovation of of um, of black women skill set love set. Um, uh, nurturing set like you know agricultural um environmental um all of the things are actually what fed fed the name it's the name the name got fed by by the people and so i think that's that's one of the reasons why people will say oh it, you know maybe it was seen as like oh a dirty word but i think at certain eras it actually didn't hold everything that was there and it didn't take into account everything that was there and a, and a national um, kind of environment around feminism is very white. So it's not, it's, it's, it's not that we didn't know who we was or my grandmother didn't know who she was, is that um, uh, it, within our community, within our family, within our living and our being, we knew absolutely what was happening. But the, the way that um, black people's innovation has been treated in this particular country based on like, you know, uh, a white supremacist lens. Um, it is. It is. It's been a journey, and to show our um, how you know incredibly badass we are. Now we can sit around and say, you know, black feminist, black feminism. Like, you know, when did that? When did the, did people embrace it? When did da 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 da? Because it's it's always been here, but it's it's the 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 language has had to grow into the the giganticness of what is already in existence it's not the other way around um so i i i just really feel um so grateful for all of the um you know black people who have embraced black feminism and raised me up um along those lines and and um and that's pretty much all i got on that <laughs> so all right, thank you. Thank you. Oops. So Darius said unmuted himself. Yeah. <laughs> I, was gonna, I, was gonna, I was gonna throw you a lead in, right? <laughs> um, you know, so we, as a black man, right? How, how did you come to find uh, uh, black feminism? I think is there. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. I What Asia and uh, Toshi expressed I think is, you know, I grew up in the South. So, you know, I feel like the regalness of black women that I grew up with was pretty intense. I mean, like mother was like a thing and it was celebrated around me, you know, with all the, uh, also the, the darker side of that too, like, you know, how men would be, but there was always this capitulation to, to uh, black women, no matter who they were, um, you know, I, I, as uh, Toshi was talking, I was thinking about my great grandmother and how she lived at the top of the hill on this plantation and all of her family lived below it. And she was looked at as like royalty in this community. And I, she was enormous. She was like this frail woman, but she was enormous to all of them. You're talking about a whole community, like a town of people. 
And this one little woman lived on top of this hill. And I, and I can't get that image out of my mind. And I can't get the image out of some of the friends I had who were just kind of whole, they, 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 they weren't like, it's, it's hard for me to be like, they were this. It's like, they were everything. And that's what I learned, like, and how I really got into it. And one of the key words is love. Like, I remember going through things and having their ear more than having a Black man's ear. Like, being able to come to them with all kinds of things, deep insecurities, you know, that I, that I didn't know what to do with. And I'm not, this is not my parents. This is just, like, friends, Black women friends that I had. And um, and them encouraging me. I mean, I wouldn't even be in New York if it wasn't for a black woman. Like I wouldn't even be on this journey. You know what I'm saying? If if my friend, you know, I think about her now, she's a mother of three now, like she's like full life. And her just kind of, you know, setting me straight, <laughs> setting me straight and being like, I love you, but you need to hear these words from me right now so that I can help you be what I see you to be already. And I feel like as Black men, we kind of have to just be honest about that. And so I personally, my position is always like, you know, a deep respect um, and, um, and kind of almost like very, very protective uh, posture <laughs> from me a lot of times uh, when it comes to uh, Black women. And as far as feminism is concerned, I feel like Toshi uh, summed that up for me because I feel the same way. I didn't really grow up around that. I grew up in a very rural environment. And so Black women were working out in the fields. They were also, you know, driving tractors. They were just doing everything. And I feel like that's my experience. Like they were also like CEOs and running businesses. And I mean, just doing all kinds of making, you know, having babies. They, they made me realize that anything is possible. Sometimes more so than men, you know, cause they, they were doing everything all the time. And I feel like, you know, I've been deeply, deeply inspired by that. And, um, and also in my career, I mean, some of the things I've done has, you know, been in celebration of how I actually feel and see Black women in, in a lot of ways. Actually, Darius, can you go a little bit further um, with that? I'm really interesting. How do those Black feminist principles, are those lessons that you have learned from these women in your life, how do they inform the spaces that you create are in your classroom, in your artwork? How do we, how do we see that in action? So, so the, the idea of, of, of holistic, the holistic nature of how to be, like not coming at, at things from uh, one perspective, meaning coming at things from a, from a variety of perspectives and always making sure that a multitude of perspectives are in place at all times. That's the thing that I learned uh, early and have been and it has been reinforced throughout my life so as an example um when i went to create a piece uh, this is a perfect story so uh, my good friend faye victor you know had an experience that troubled her and she said you know these people commented and said uh, you know this performance i did with these other women sounded like cackling or whatever some vocal thing and and you know hearing her story and in the distress that she felt in that moment um you know i can't take that away i can't do anything about it but the reality is it it spurred me on to create a project for four women and dealing with the idea of of birth but not birth in the sense of how we see it here on earth, but the idea of unity, the idea of galvanizing multiple perspectives. So the four women were bringing their perspectives like from divergent backgrounds together to actually create life. And so to me, that in a lot of ways is how I feel like in a, that's a principle. Like when you think about the holistic uh, concepts 
um, that Bell Hooks talks about. It's just like, it's all about that. It's like bringing all of those different components together to actually create uh, a more, um, I forget the word that she uses, but um, it's about creating a oneness with inside of oneself that is actually like broad and open. So, I mean, that's kind of what I'm doing. And I try to seek that out in the individuals that I work with and the people that I surround myself with and also the organizations that I choose to uh, lend my energy to. All right, thank you. Um, for all the panelists, what does it mean for each of you to think about non-hierarchical models in the spaces you find yourself in? Um, how are you teaching and sharing information with the folks that will come next? We can start with you, Asia. Yeah, um, I think a lot about that and, um, and, and definitely try to center um, these principles in my work. One of the things I think about is uh, power structures, how to um, help and facilitate uh, a, a, the, the most egalitarian environment and po you know possible. I think um, you know definitely traditionally in our education systems. I think in the United States, for example, um, there is absolutely that hierarchy there. I don't come into um, my classes as you know, as a professor. I don't step in as um, you know, omnipotent, all knowing, I cannot be challenged, you know, um, of course, I'm coming from an area of expertise of area um, of lots of many, many years of hard work, um, like anybody else, um, sweat equity, all of that. Um, but at the same time, I'm not, I don't seek to create environments where students cannot challenge me, or they cannot, or they do not feel that they can contribute um, from their experiences from their perspectives. Um, I also try to, um, as best as possible, see ways in which I can help foster and create community in class. Like how can we see um, this class, any class, any semester also, how can we also function um, as a community? Uh, you know, don't just look at me, look at who you are in class with, um, how, you know, how, and, and um, how can we move forward in this material um, together? Uh, that's one of the ways, um, being as collaborative as possible um, in my work environments with my colleagues. How do we partner? How do we also thinking about like divisions of labor, right? You can even think about in your work environment, whatever that work environment is. And something that is far too often, is still far too often happens is you know, a bulk of the work or a lot of the work will fall on the shoulders of black women in work environments. And it will also become invisible labor. It will become sometimes free labor. That's not right. Um, you know, how are we considering um, how even when you're on teams um, and, and, and this also in, this is, happens in performance too, but you know, where is there equity in the labor in the work, right? Is everybody, valued for their contributions. Um, what are we assuming about anybody in that? You know, these, these are some of the ways that are just, um, I wouldn't say like happening in the background, but are, are definitely, because um, they're not background things, but these are definitely ways that inform my thinking for how I approach any environment, any workspace and creative space as well. All right, thank you, Asia. Um, so, Toshi, um, I'm also interested in this to you as well. Um, particularly when it thinks that when we think about folks who come behind us, how do we create models? Um, I know you've been doing some really amazing work with Parable, um, touring internationally. Shout out to you! Um, but how do we also make sure other artists have these frameworks and these models so they not necessarily emulate, but have these possibility models and understand? how to get into certain certain places in their in their artwork. I mean, I I think there's like, you know, hierarchy everywhere. Um, and I don't know that all of it comes from like a bad place, you know. I I mean, I think the the country is 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 was created, the economy of the country is created in such a severe and violent way. Um, like dominated by white men and for hundreds of years. And inside of resistance 
um, and cultivation, you know, there's, there's a hierarchical structure of leadership. There's usually when someone is creating a movement, there's a hierarchical structure inside of the movement. And it's not, it's not even, um, you know, somebody started it, somebody created, um, you know, some people created Black Lives Matter, like that was an actual creation, you know, and we know who did it. Like, so it's, it's, it's um, the cultivation of, of kindness and generosity the, the cultivation of creating systems where um, multiple voices can be heard and where the, the actions um, that are created are considerate of all kinds of people who have all kinds of capacity. That's, that is a new thing for this country. Um, we, this country is, is not created on that. That's a new thing. We are like babies in it. And, and, and I'm so grateful for a lot of the um, movements that have come along because each one has pushed, pushed us towards a new way of thinking about our togetherness. And um, in terms of, you know, most of my work is congregational work and it's not all, always centered around a stage. I'm always thinking about, um, I'm always thinking about other people. I'm always excited about other people and I'm particularly excited about people younger than me. Um, but I'm also excited about people older than me. I, I just always feel like I can learn something from everybody. And a lot of, a lot of my work um, is based on, especially with Parable, um, setting up systems for what is already there in communities that we go to, as opposed to like, let us come in and bring our Octavianness to you and tell you about it. When we know almost every community in America has some somebody who is already familiar with Octavia's work is already using Parable of the Sower as a tool, whether they be an academic teaching it or whether they're an artist or you know whether they're a kid like starting to write their own stories. So I I love to take advantage of that. I, and when I have resources, I love to fund that. Um, when I don't have financial resources, I offer myself. <laughs> is there anything we could do together? And um, we are a long way from, you know, uh, I think, you know, getting rid of some of the harmful hierarchical ways of existence. But I have to say every generation of, um, you know, people that come, I feel like in movement work, um, particularly around a black um, BIPOC, queer, trans, um, all, all kinds of people, those movements seem to have at, at, at a base that there should be a very wide circle of voices heard with like, with consideration of like the language we're gonna use to talk to each other and bringing in more things. If you look at the civil rights movement, there was not necessarily a, you know, a, a food justice movement attached to it or a climate you know, awareness movement or save water movement, but like almost every room I'm in, the intersectionality between our issues um, actually brings more equality inside of groups because that's different people who know about all the things that we actually need. There's no one person that knows everything. And I think that that generational pull and then more inclusivity among the people who are in rooms and the issues that we all need to be concerned about. Thank you, Darius. <laughs> I mean, what, what else do I need to add? I mean, I, I both Asia and, and, and Toshi, I mean, I'm doing, you know, for me, I, I feel like I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing a lot of those things in my life and and believe in them deeply. And I try to I try to live by example. I, I don't, you know, I, I think one of the things that has really deeply affected me is, is the fact that, you know, as black folks, you know, I mean, I think we sometimes are a lot more covert. <laughs> about these ideas, you know, instead of being overt about them. Like we, we're in our little silos and we're doing our thing, 
but we're not actually being as overt. You know, some people may be some people, but I don't think these ideas are uh, as foreign to us as we like, maybe like people to think they are or something like that. But, you know, it's like in our communities, be like, yo, blah, blah, blah. But it's like, I think sometimes we're like on some, you know, in the closet vibe, you know, on these issues. And, and we actually do believe in this stuff because we were raised, you know, in a certain kind of uh, environment. And I'm not saying everybody is like this, but I, I think the thing that for me that has deeply changed is just like being more and more overt. Yes, I do social justice work, but it, in my art and I and in and, and the things that I do, I go out there and I challenge people's views on all types of things, you know, regard, you know, all the issues that we're talking about. Uh, but the performance is not the thing. I mean, it's like when I step off that stage, I'm still challenging those views. I'm still trying to move society into a better space because I see society from a, from a standpoint that it's just like, yeah, this is broken. We need to change this. Yes, I know that the founding fathers or the idea of this place was one thing, but I believe that it can change. I believe that we can change the country and make it into this better thing. And, and if, I, if we look at what's happening right now, we're really coming to that sort of like place where it has to evolve. You don't have, like, it's like you're seeing the other side actually turn into a straight up monster. And so, and, and so what do you do? You know what I'm saying? You have to kind of gather all the forces together and say, hey, we, we can't be quiet anymore. We have to be, you know, just, you know, outright and say everything out loud at this point. All right. Thank you, Darius. I'm going to throw the question back, this question to Toshi, because I know she has to leave soon. Um, and how do you choose the projects um, or how do you evaluate the people, organization, groups, institution, companies, et cetera, in terms of goals and of alignment that you work with? Um, I think one Black feminine practice is the ability to say no, right, into things that a, don't serve us and things that don't necessarily fit um, your values. I mean, I have a mission in life. I have a job to do and I have things I want to accomplish before I die. And, um, and I just do whatever it takes to get where I know I need to go. And I have worked with some shitty people um, to get something that I want. And I have worked with some incredible people inside of awful institutions who are, you know, kind of doing what Darius just said, like going to work and then like, you know, figuring out how to inch possibilities, uh, uh, make a way out of no way. And, um, and I've worked with wonderful people who turn out to be assholes. Like, <laughs> it's just like, <laughs> I work with people who have gotten a job and don't know how to do their job, but you know what? We gonna get this show done. We gonna get this this thing built. We gonna we go educate these children. Like you know, it's it's you say I say no when I when I think I might die, and I say no when I think I can't accomplish my mission, and I say no when I when I don't see how to get through, you know, like the bullshit. But I will say, you know, I've been on projects, I've been on a project where I got fired up on the project three times and, you know, I left and I was like, that's it. And I got on an airplane and my ancestors jumped me and were like, oh, where are you going? And I was like, I'm going to Chicago. I'm not even lying. I'm on a plane listening to some music and they're talking to me. And they're like, oh, you're going to Chicago because this project was about an elder, right? And, and they were like, you're going to Chicago. And they were like, where are we? And I was like, we on an airplane. And they're like, what's that? And I was like, it's like a way to travel, but like you in the air. They're like, you can fly now, you know? And they're like, where are you going to stay? I'm like a hotel. They're like, what's that? You know, uh, do you get paid to do that? How much are you getting paid to sing? 
How many songs are you gonna sing? I'm gonna sing one song. How much are they paying you? A thousand dollars. You getting paid a thousand dollars to sing one song? Like, I mean, it was relentless. Like the, you know, what you think your job is, where you think you should go, how you think you should be, contextually just kept evolving on that plane flight. And by the time I landed, <laughs> the director was like, you have to come back. And I said, yes. And I finished the job, right? You know, it's not, it's, it's not, you know, and I really, I really do love that there is room to talk about Black women joy, Black women rest, Black women, um, Black feminists, Black peoples um, need to not be in a constant state of, of work and effort, that that is evolving um, on the platforms of movements and it is righteous. And even with that, we are still navigating some of the worst territory that exists in the universe. We are the most destructive force in the universe, humans, people. So if you are part of the most destructive force in the universe and you know that we should not be that, then you are, you are going to always be in uh, the purpose of ending that dynamic. And your choices um, have to be expansive. And some of them are gonna be great. And some of them you're just gonna be like, okay, let me just go. And then, and that's how I do it, you know? And I, I have an agenda and the agenda is fluid. It changes with the generations that come that tell me what I'm supposed to do for them. Thank you for that, Toshi. Uh, I'm going to give you the two questions that the audience have for you. Um, that okay. way you can bless us before you leave. Um, first question is, could Toshi speak more about her concept of her work, of congregational work? And the second question is, with respect to your work on Octavia Butler, personally, what elements of her vision and voice have influenced your own music? And for those not familiar with her work, what would you direct people towards? Huh. Terrible. Um, okay, what was the first one again? <laughs> um, they, they're interested in the congregational work, um, how you're in the communities uh, you bring parable to. Yeah, so, con you know, congregation just really means I don't like to do things by myself. And I grew up, I grew up in a, you know, my mother is Bernice Johnson Regan. My mother um, was a, uh, you know, moved us to DC. She went to Howard to get her PhD, but she also became music director of a company called um, the DC Black Repertory Company. And Sweet Honey in the Rock was born out of that company. And she took us with her and she, and we would, so we would spend, me and my little brother would spend all day in a theater. And so we got to see people work like on creating things. And it, it just, it was the most, it was the best time. And then when the shows happened, we would just go and they, we could see shows over and over again. To this day, I love going to rehearsals or any kind of like practices, sports, anything people are doing together where they're trying to figure things out. Um, and then with Sweet Honey, I really got to see like what it means to, um, you know, consider musicians um, individual voices so that you know you're not necessarily and i know darius knows what i'm talking about because i just saw a video of you with like two drummers <laughs> playing and i was like yes that's the congregational opportunity um so it really means like you know you're i in my bands i'm not really trying to get people to do something super specific for to me like there's a song but i'm trying to actually hear their voice inside of the music and um and I think that can be done in, in, in any way. I'm often telling people like when it's time to vote, why not get people together and like have tea and like, you know, have a party and like really get people into voting. Like now we have learned our lesson. Like when you don't vote, you're not helping yourself. Why not make that a, a congregational moment? So, um, and then for Parable uh, of the Sower, um, Octavia, that book is, is really so great because it is, it is about it such a strong intention in like the worst time. It just starts off with a 15 year old girl declaring her God, God has changed. And then looking at a community that she's grown up in that's behind a wall. 
um, because everything else is, is so dangerous. And then she creates her vision and her vision is like, not to stay behind the safety of this wall, but to like actually leave and to, into the unknown and dangerous territory. And I, I love the, I love this because, you know, a lot of black music, a lot of movement music really talks about like how we are gonna stay somewhere, how we're not gonna be moved, how we're gonna be, we're gonna hold our ground, we're gonna take this territory back, we're gonna do this. And Octavia is like, you are gonna leave. Like you're, you're gonna leave, like you, you can't stay, like you won't survive. And not only does the girl want, want to leave, she says our destination is, is to, to be amongst the stars. Um, so that just, you know, I, already, I always say, but we are amongst the stars already as a planet. Um, and this is the only planet for us, no matter what they tell you, this is the only place humans belong in the universe. We don't belong nowhere else. Um, but musically, Octavia's journey and parable gave my mother and I access to, you know, over 200 years of black music that could arc the, the journey of, of all of the things that, that path that she created through um, Parable of the Sower and into Parable of the Talents. Like we were really easily able to sing an arc of, of those conditions because we've already experienced many of those conditions. And Octavia asks you to go out and make congregation with people you don't know. And she also asks you to, to be as ready as you can be for what you don't know is going to happen. And she also asks you to look good enough and scary enough that people won't attack you, but attract those who need somebody like you. So it is, it is like a multiple opportunity of, of creation, um, which really gave, gave us the, 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 the room to musically operate in that same way. What are the songs that, you know, can attract those who need to hear those songs into raising their voices with us? And that's kind of like an undercurrent throughout the show. The other one is, is the, as, as um, Lauren Alamina starts to find her voice, the, the music moves like up in time. So we start really with spirituals. We start with like old songs. And then as she starts to find her voice, we move up through, through time and you start to hear other genres of music. Um, and and that's, that was fun to do. It's very subtle, but you know, because, but that, that I wanted to pay a respect to um, the journey starting in an old place. And really Octavia is like, no, let's keep going. That like, it's not an ending. So I hope that answers for whoever asked those questions. That's powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, actually, Asia. <laughs> um, thinking about all the things that Lauren had to go through in her particular world. Um, what have you, this to all the panelists, but I'm gonna start with you, Asia. What have you had to unlearn in the process of reflecting on your identity, maybe your goals during this pandemic as we're going through these very turbulent, turbulent times? What have you unlearned or rethink that was possible perhaps? Huge question. Um, one, I just, while it's, you know, is this, I wanna say, just circle back a little bit to Toshi. I just really appreciate the distinctions that you are um, voicing and um, and in your work. And thank you for that. Thank you. And, and this is just that's very the distinctions of mission oriented, being mission oriented. The distinctions of congressional or congreg, you know, and being in congregation and that being part of work. So I just want to say that because um, that's resonating with me for for sure. Um, unlearning. Um, I, <laughs> I think, I, I think that, um, you know, of, of course, I think before the panorama, before this pandemic, 
um, uh, and, and, and and during, and I think after, I think it's important for us in, in many ways to be constantly, as much as we can in states of unlearning, and when I'm saying unlearning things that are, that do not serve me, that do not serve us. And, um, and there are ways too that I think that there are things or tools or um, that things that serve us at a per certain point of time that then we come to find that when we get to a point in life or a season in life or things like that, they do, they no, they just no longer do. So, you know, I kind of bless that, send it on its way and try to embrace, um, you know, what's new for me. I think, um, I also think unlearning is hard. Um, I, I, there's ways that I think it's easier to learn something than it is to unlearn uh, something. Because mm -hmm. often when we are in the practice of unlearning something, we're unlearning something that's maybe even quite calcified uh, within us. Um, to me, which is a, a much more challenging process than when I'm coming from a place of, I don't know, let's explore, let's see what I, you know, and I'm learning something from the ground up. That's hard, um, but it always has been for me a point of m my best growth. So I think for me, and uh, what have I been experiencing in um, this pandemic um, is uh, going back to the idea of community and how, and, and also that's, I'm, I'm a person, I feel like I will never be outside of community. I will never operate outside of community. And so how do, how, how does that function now and in the space where, um, you know, I, I, where we are being socially distant, um, right? And but I think more, what I've learned more that is that, um, no, we are necessarily being physically distant, um, but I haven't been socially distant. Um, and very, um, it's my community is very present um, in my life, me and theirs, every single day, which to me only um, makes me more grateful, but also makes me really see, you know, also that true nature um, of the way that community is functioning because it's, it's not happening because it's dependent on us seeing each other every day. Um, and there are ways that we might even be showing up in each other's lives even more dynamically uh, than before, you know, when we are in the rush of the go and to and coming from and all of that. Um, also, uh, unlearning ways of uh, maybe how I structure time or um, or work or for example when everything is happening kind of in the same messy space <laughs> mm -hmm. um, uh, where you're zoomed out where you yeah you know, where I used to have like a separation like if you're physically going to a space to work and you're physically coming home there's something in that separation, you know, mentally, um, emotionally, or what have you. So, how do you break that up? How do you um, set up boundaries and um, and reinforce them so that you're still um, taking care of? And 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 I know we talk about self care a lot, but I really do mean that. And um, and uh, yeah, and so maybe there are things now that I can see. Oh, maybe that was kind of a bad habit. And so, um, and maybe I don't even need to do that. So I try to think about the things that I'm, uh, um, like, what will I leave in this pandemic? And um, I try to ask myself regularly, I know what I walked into the pandemic with, but maybe there's some stuff we need to leave. And, I'm, and I wanna try to do that. Thank you, Asia. Darius? Um. You know, I think the thing that I had to unlearn was the idea of performance. Like, what is performance? I mean, when your gigs get all canceled <laughs> and then, you know, you have to get on, you do these Zoom performances and they don't do the same thing. And you, then you start asking yourself, why? Um, and I had this epiphany recently about what it is that we do as artists. And our job is to gather, is to gather people, is to gather souls together. And, you know, I mean, when we go out there 
and step on a stage, it's almost like a call, like we're caught, like I know we show up and there's an audience, but in all reality, it's just like, I think that's the unnatural element of what we do that we were doing before. I think in all reality, it's just like people in the force making sound together and people coming to the sound and having an experience with that sound. And, 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 and then there, you create community within that sound. And then people have an experience and then they decide to come back to that sound at some point or they choose not to come back to that sound. But it's like almost like, it's like this sort of like vibrational thing. And I think when we don't have an audience, what do we really, you know, no one's there. I, I find myself wanting to just commune with the individuals who are there in the room with me, which is the musicians. I find myself not even wanting to act as if this is a performance, but to be like the, the pygmy, to be like the person in a tribe, to be just like, here we are together. Let's like, you know, cry out to, you know, whomever, you know, to the stars and have a moment together and commune. And the thing that I keep thinking about with this pandemic is like, it's making you, it's making me, I should say this, it's making me reevaluate that even more and making me think about ways to just do things with individuals that I love that have nothing to do with uh, a destination. That has nothing to do with like, oh, we're doing this to get somewhere. It's just like, I'm just doing this because I love you cats. And I love the way you sound. I love what's going on with you. And I want to just do this like with us right now. And can we do it again next week or whenever you're ready? You know what I'm saying? And I, and I, and I just, I just, I hope that, that we can do more of that on the other side, you know, <laughs> it's just like, than we did before when we were so busy and we really didn't have the time and whatnot. Because I, I, I think that that's really special. And I think we need to stop, you know, when we do go back to performing, I think we need to reevaluate what that is. I know I'm going to do that from this point on, really look at it very differently and almost try to structure it differently. Um, you know, because I've already, I try to do that in some ways, but I think, like I said before, I'm gonna be more deliberate with a lot of, of my actions going forward all right thank you jerry it's, i'm you got it joshia i feel like you, you got something in your spirit yeah i do i was just thinking you said unlearn but i just want to say what i learned okay <laughs> tell us what you learned. Oh. what I learned i learned that i don't like pandemics and i learned me too that i was like i i don't even i mean we were and we we're doing parable in a room of 1800 people and I got hugged by at least 200 of them and kissed and everything and and I I'm so grateful that I didn't get COVID but I I just like had such a great fear of just the basics of existence because this thing operates on the basics of existence of just like what we know about living. And I was like, oh, that doesn't work. It, it doesn't work to go outside. It doesn't work to get on an airplane. It's like, like everything is dangerous. Like everything is dangerous. And that, that was just, I didn't do any music that first two months, except for like saying at a couple of funerals and I had to kickstart myself. And the other thing I learned about was adrenaline. Like I really didn't understand my mach the machine, my machine, um, the Toshi Regan machine is, it runs at a high speed. And I don't mean like, I'm like busy, but like, like if you think about when an engine of a car goes and they say like, you know, it's four cylinder, six cylinder, eight, 12, like I operate with a, like a, I'm a gigantic car. I'm like a tractor or something like, 
and to, to like watch it just kind of like a like just, just be like no zero um was really interesting and it made me think about like the adrenaline that I use and in, in the world and and put out and the other was you were talking about hier hierarchy and hier hierarchical institutions I just really could see in a, a very severe way by how COVID was affecting communities and certain people, um, our condition as, as a congregation of humans in the places that we were and how much more work we need to do around uh, our economy and access to housing and access to food. Like, like I was just like, oh my God, like, you can, you can have it in your mind, like, you know, we really, the economy is just leaving out all these people. Or we can say in New York, oh, housing issues are really, really bad. Look at all of these new buildings they're building, nobody can afford. But the Octavia's world comes out of conditions like this. The most horrific places come out of conditions like this. And our inability to shift dramatically to the moment. Not, not just be loving and caring and, and extend empathy, but to, sh to shift dramatically to what is happening. That some people are using COVID to like kill people and to get businesses and to do this and using the fact that it's there. And I was like, how can we use this to actually advance out of the dystopian narrative that would actually work for people like the last administration and a lot of the people who are still in power. So I, I was like, what is the big thing to do? What is the dramatic shift to actually uplift and, um, and make change and accessibility and to raise issues? And I think we saw what happens when that dramatic shift happens in response to, the, to George Floyd, that we change the narrative and I think this idea of like the other side, the other side doesn't exist. There's not no other side, there is a continuation. And so I think I, I'm gonna jump off of this after saying all this shit, but what, what I, I'm really sorry because I should stay. <laughs> but um, what I wanna say is like that, that is not, that, that push, uh, that dramatic shift, that, that those gigantic steps of change are the beginning of ongoing possibilities for us. And it does not have to be 2024, we are sitting in Octavia's world. It actually could be 2024, we are getting a hold of this country. We are getting a hold of our position on this planet. We're getting a hold of what it actually means to live. And yes, you know, black feminism, black women, black art, black people, black everything. But the, the coalition of humanists, the coalition of humanity um, needs to actually understand what this moment is about. And it is about our transition as we are on this planet. And peace. <laughs> and mic drop. <laughs> no mic drop, just like handing, handing it off to the, the brilliant people who are still gonna be on this call. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I love y'all, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Bryce. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Toshi. Thank you so Thank you. much. Bye. Bye. Okay. I think along the lines of where Toshi is that we have a question from the audience. It says that it sounds like the panelists are optimistic that this way of thinking, being in the world, is entering center stage now. Is this true that they think this? Um, could you say more about it? Um, you know, it, it, and I, hi, Tracy. Um, yeah, so optimism, um, I think as a person, uh, you know, I am, you know, I'm generally optimistic. I think that is about, um, more so being hopeful. I think, you know, I think of, you know, the ways of, you know, talking about like black joy is, um, is resistance. Right. And, and so, Optimism is also similar, uh, you know, for, for me in that um, 
it's that so the being in the world is you know that it's I'm, I'm reading this it's center, that is center stage now um I um I am hopeful I am hopeful that the ways of thinking that really have as we've talked about you know already um, um today and kind of established you know, right away that um this it, it's this thinking is not new this thinking is um and people uh, whole entire communities have been operating based off of this um for generations right uh, you know, for generations and um so this is now intergenerational understanding intergenerational knowledge um much as similar to what you know darius was talking about in his experiences early on um so I want, you know, when I think about like center stage, I mean, who stage? Um, who stage? Uh, I am um, hopeful that, you know, of course, as a society, as a culture, um, that we have um, more of a listening for it, more of, um, and also uh, what Black feminism teaches us is centering the voices, prioritizing the voices of, of those who are in the most marginalized positions. And with that, I would also say the, you know, the uh, giving, giving them the space, the resources um, and the listening. So I'm hopeful that that happens more and more and but only but that only harkens back to generations before me when you have Anna Julia Cooper and then later, you know, Fannie Lou Hamer. And essentially, you know, we uh, none of us are free, and you know, in, until all of us are free, right? This is how do um, I'm interested in a liberated stage, you know, I'm interested in the liberation, right? And 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 how um principles of black feminism helps get us there and and yes i'm hopeful um that we're moving uh you know more boldly and boldly in a continuation actually though that but that, that we're moving more boldly forward but i also don't necessarily think progress happens in a linear fashion um in as much as we would want it to be um but i do know we have the tools and the principles to carry on um no in in the face of anything i hope that answers the question i think so uh, darius um you know I, I think if i was to just add anything to asia's thing i feel like you know I'm optimistic that people understand the importance of voting inside of the system. You know, it's just like, I feel like Black women have been saying for ages, <laughs> vote. They have been putting their life on the line to encourage people to vote, to show people the importance of voting. And Black women have been trying to get Black people to understand the importance of voting. And I think the thing, if I was to say anything about it, it's just like, we have to continue to vote. We can't say, oh, we, we, we got rid of this maniac and now we're done. It's like, no, 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 no. We have a lot of work to do. And I hope that people understand that and really listen uh, to all those Black women, you know, uh, uh, to, uh, Asia uh, brought up Fanny. It's just like, it's not just Rosa Parks, all of them. They are just trying to get us to understand the importance of this. And I feel like if we as a community at, at this juncture turn our back on, the, on, on, on actually showing up Voting, I love the thing that Toshi brought up about, you know, getting community, whole communities together and doing little parties and stuff on voting day. It's like, yes, like we have to do this to save not this country, but ourselves mm -hmm. from this country, you know? And they're gonna try all kinds of crazy shit to keep us from not voting, obviously, but we can overcome it. We've done it multiple times and we could do it again. 
at this point, they've shown their evil hand. We see it. Now we have to show uh, uh, the hand that we have, which is something that is actually beautiful. And I feel like we've been showing that in sort of microcosmic ways, but I think it's time for us to hit them with the macro um, way so that we can actually, you know, uh, affect major change. Right now, you know, you know, we made a little dent, but it's, it's, it's not enough. We got to keep going. So yeah, that's my position. But we we've been told you sign <laughs> sign black women. <laughs> yeah, black women have been saying it for a long time. So yeah, I appreciate that. Going going back uh, towards uh, there's a question here that says, how would you like to see the jazz community embrace black feminist ideas more? In what ways? How do you see jazz being transformed by black feminism? Hmm. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Standpoint, and then I'll. Yeah, yeah. I mean, for me, I think you've got to get rid of the hierarchical system that exists within uh, jazz. So, meaning, like, this is the best. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? This is, you know, this is the superstar. This is who we should be paying attention to right now. And then we don't pay attention to them later. You know, I, I think all of that stuff is silly. <laughs> it, it's just like we all know that just because the person is um, on top right now or they have something that, you know, kind of spark, that doesn't negate all the stuff that someone else is doing or has done. And I feel like we kind of, you know, young musicians kind of get caught up in that and and then they seek that. And I feel like we, we that sort of uh, patriarchal, system has to just be completely disbanded. Also, we need to have, uh, you know, leaderless bands more. We need to see more of that energy. You know, just collectives, like people kind of coming together, creating scenes and sounds that are an embodiment of, you know, a community of people. You know, the ACM was an example of that. We should see more of that kind of energy. Um, I feel like another component is the school system. The schools need a change because, you know, they hold the majority of the, um, the wealth in this uh, jazz industry. And so, you know, we have to change the way uh, jazz schools operate. You know, majority of the time, the leaders of those schools are men, <laughs> you know, from the tippy tippy top. <laughs> of the sphere and so you know and uh, and if they're not it's a white woman and so it's just like you gotta you gotta like you know black women should be all up in that and black men and black people black folks period all of it it should just transform and i believe that if we transform that a lot would actually happen um for uh the jazz industry as a whole also you know it disturbs me that we literally do not have any black female writers, you know, talking about this music, working at major uh, papers and stuff like that. We don't have black women critiquing the music enough. Um, and I feel like that would be a, a huge help. You know, we need, we need their perspective. I mean, we get it <laughs> at shows and stuff like that. But I feel like, you know, it would be great to get it on a major scale. So. Um, yeah, um, I agree with a, a lot of what um, Darius is saying there. Um, you know, and um, it, it, one of the, when the last thing you, you were saying, I, I, what I'm thinking, who I'm thinking of right now is the work, you know, that Shannon Effinger has been doing. And, and we need more Shannon Effingers um, for sure. Uh, the ways that it that um, black feminism and black feminist thought can transform jazz, or in maybe and even has been in the process of doing so, is very much what you know Darius is saying about dismantling i you know ideas of hierarchy power. More so, if we're talking about power structures and the way power works um, in that context, which you know are patriarchal uh, power structures, right, and have been on. Um, the uh, it, 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 in large also the um, you know in terms of who also gets access 
um, to those spaces, uh, and it, and that means you know more. Though it means more voices, more eyes, more insight, more ears, right? And um, what will happen with the music, or what will happen with those tradition, is going to be what happens with you know those people, the artists themselves, right? So um, that is going to be what the artists bring to that. But but it's what what we're talking about is more structural changes, right? So that the music, that the art can function in ways that it has yet to be. You know, it, you know, it, in our institute, you know, we talk about the concept of like jazz without patriarchy, and that's actually very provocative because we are asking people to imagine with us what that could look like, sound like, be like, feel like, right? Um, because we haven't had that. There has been, you know, no jazz without patriarchy. There has not been a United States without patriarchy. Um, there uh, has not been anything that exists in our society as it exists today without that. Um, so in fact, we're, you have to you talk about the unlearning, but also um, imagining, reimagining, but you know, something that has not existed, um, but is absolutely and entirely possible. Asia, I'm really interested in within your institute, what are some ways that you are centering, uplifting uh, non-binary folks and trans folks, right? Uh, segment of society or, that can be invisibilized, ignored um, and not seen, particularly in like a very highly gendered world like jazz. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, was, it was really um, wonderful when I, uh, you know, we, we, we formed in 2008, so we're still very new in terms of an institution, but one of the things that, um, that we kind of experienced early on were non-binary trans students actually seeking us out, right? Um, even before we started any kind of aims in recruitment, and um, I was so heartened by that because it's, it's, it was students seeing, you know, they saw the announcements, they saw that this was gonna exist. They saw that, um, you know, eventually classes are gonna run, the courses are gonna be running, which they do now. We run about six ensembles. Um, we have uh, Terry Lynn Carrington, Chris Davis, Linda Mahon O, uh, Val Genty uh, running our ensembles. I teach courses, um, you know, as an ethnomusicologist, I teach our, uh, more liberal arts oriented courses, so jazz, gender society, African-American music history, all of that. And so we were being sought out for the spaces that we were seeking to create and eventually create um, at this institute. And um, that made me feel very proud. That made me, uh, I was very hope in that other case in terms of hopeful um, because that's absolutely the spaces that we seek to uh, create, maintain and sustain uh, in our institute and through the work of our institute and that, um, uh, and that people are feeling safe and brave you know, and the opportunity for that um, in our spaces. So again, that comes back from, you know, circling back to this idea of, you know, black feminist thought, because this is, we are creating these spaces, making sure that we are trying to prioritize those in the most marginalized um, spaces uh, and identities in that intersectionality. Um, and then we listen. Right. And I think that's something that black feminism and music obviously shares, like the principle of listening, right? And listening first. So it's not for me to say what the a trans student, a non-binary student, um, the 100 percent needs, right? It's it's for me to also, and for us as an institute to also listen and be constantly uh, listening. Um, for what type of experiences they seek, what type of experiences they are having, um, you know, what's working, what's not working, all of that, uh, so that we can um, provide that, support it, uh, and also shift, move, adjust where we need to, right? And then eventually, it, and, it, and it absolutely ends up benefiting everybody. Um, the other thing I've noticed, you know, in, in that kind of idea, you know, um, none of us are free until all of us are free. I've also noticed with the cisgender 
male students um, uh, within our institute also voicing that um, our, you know, coming into our ensembles, coming into our um, and spaces feels different and more freeing for them, that they don't feel the need to or the pressure of, you know, performing a certain type of masculinity on top of, you know, an often toxic masculinity on top of um, all that performing requires, music requires, jazz requires, like these are young artists seeking to master this art form. That's hard enough. Like there's enough heart in that. Um, and I think any jazz artist would tell you there's enough heart in that. So even for those um, students that identify that way, um, it, you know, having to do that and then have to try to master this and then try to have to perform a certain type of masculinity on top of that, um, they're exhaust they're exhausted, right? And who's got time for that? So um, this is these are some of the things that we've been up to. And again, it's been not very long, but we have like grown grown by leaps and bounds um, since day one. And I'm looking forward to uh, every, you know, all the other things that we will be up to to continue to push this forward. And again, make that um, lasting cultural shift. We are up to the work of transformation. Thank you, Asia. Um, I think, yeah, students now are just way better at articulating and having the language uh, to talk about their different varied experiences of gender and how expansive it, it, it is. I think shifting uh, to artists, so Darius, get ready. It's a long question, you ready? Um, artists are well acquainted with the grind, the hustle, and the consensuality to be commodified in order to survive a capitalist world. How much agency do you think artists can have in this effect? This beautiful vision of abundance and shifted focus on why and how we come together as we continue to strive for our value and sweat equity as the world reopens. So, you know, um, I, I'm not sure I, you know, I think the whole grind thing is, there's a lot of ego in that to me. <laughs> you know, I'm grinding, I'm doing, you know, it's just like, it's aggressive. <laughs> it's, it's a little, like, I think, I think, you know, I'm not sure we should be grinding the same way. Here, here's how I see it now. You know, we should be asking for what we're worth. Here's, and here's an example of that. Now, since the Zoom and, and everything, you know, we, we almost have to become like TV producers, <laughs> you know, which is a skill set that honestly speaking, as musicians, you know, we don't really have that skill set. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Like, I think we need to be honest about what it takes to actually put a TV show or do a, you know, a video, you know, properly together. It's one thing to be like, yo, I'm going to throw some stuff up there. And so, you know, if someone's asking you to do something, you need to think about what, what you're worth. And you should demand that they actually give you uh, the, uh, equitable amount of money that will be for that that is uh appropriate for the job and the job meaning because this is the thing a lot of times people pay us for our performance like it's like they don't see all the shit that went in to that beforehand so you know the hours of practice writing the music getting the musicians together if you're the leader if you're not the leader showing up to rehearsals or reading over the music, practicing all that stuff. Oh yeah, getting on the subway or flying or whatever to get to the gig. You know, I feel like, I feel like we need to start paying people uh, to be artists. And our society really doesn't do that. You know, unless you, unless they feel like they can make money off it uh, off of it themselves. This is a problem. You need to rethink the musician that uh, the the artist that is the artist of the community, meaning the person that's just there all the time. 
that's not going to fly away. That's not going to do, but actually is entertaining you at, at the restaurant. The person that you see at the local uh, jazz club every Tuesday. The person that you that 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 somehow shows up, you know, around town and you see them perform at some sort of underground space. Understand that that person has a life. And so we need, as artists, all of us need to start asking for what we're worth and not be afraid of the word no and not be so afraid of the idea of not having. Because think about it like this: what have you had during this pandemic? You know, really think about it. Did it kill you? <laughs> you know, I find myself saying no a lot. I mean, I said no a lot before, but I say no a lot more now. And it's because I understand that this is not always going to be the way it is. And I don't want the, 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 the equity that I've built up to this point to not be as worth worthy of uh, uh, as to have the worth that I believe it has, because I'm still practicing. I'm still developing my craft. I'm still getting better. And you have to look at yourself that way too. And so you should ask for what you want. And, and here's the beautiful thing as a community. If we all do it, then we all benefit. And so if we can all start thinking like a community instead of individuals, then I believe beautiful things can actually take place. We have to stop. That's the, you know, and to, to tie it back into uh, Black feminism, that's a beautiful, like major component of Black feminism. It's like the community, the, the whole. Like we have to start thinking like that. Yeah, thank you, Darius. Um, and I think as far as like paying people for the words and their time and the effort it takes to do any kind of Zoom production, me as a theater artist, I think institutions also are able to see maybe some of the inequities that maybe they're blinded to before. Because we're giving, we're taking a, a given that everyone has a practice space. Everyone has Wi-Fi capable of doing Zoom performances and capable of doing all of those different things. And if you're asking people to come and perform or talk to you, how are you also making sure they're it's accessible, they have a place, all these different things that I think institutions actually have to see what artists are thinking are having to deal with um, in their own personal life. Well, I might have a place where I can actually practice by myself if you paid me enough in the beginning. <laughs> Maybe had to not have 12 roommates. Um, that part. <laughs> yes, talk about it. We have a question, and, and, and maybe, um, Asia, you might be able to um, answer this. It says, have you given up on code switching? If so, advice for students created social justice compositions in the majority white classroom. Mm, 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 mm. Have I given up on code switching? <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm wondering if this, uh, if this uh, person means um, the need to code switch for uh, approval for white approval um, and appeasement, uh, and uh, that's not something I'm I'm invested in at all, right? Um, I appreciate um, the many ways in um, which we can speak, and um, again, this goes back to community in ways that we can speak and and, and in closer proximity to each other, you know, like uh, lessening the gap, you know, in community. Um, and also locality, you know, I mean, here's the thing, you know, being, you know, being from Detroit, when, when I uh, encounter another Detroiter, I'm like, what up though? I mean, and anybody from Detroit, well, and at this particular times, under knows and understands that. And I love that, right? Um, I am, I, I absolutely, American, African-American vernacular, English, you know, I, I see it as a language, I see it as, um, you know, it, as an intelligence. And I think that's the other part is often we're looking at the vernacular or the vernacular is, um, is, uh, is uh, you know, considered less intelligent. And if, have you ever listened to people? Um, you listen to what they are saying and how they are saying it. Also, there's an art to that as well. Um, and, uh, and I also feel the, uh, you know, feel the ability to move in and out as I choose. That's the, you know, for me, that's the point. It, it, move in and out as I choose um, 
at you know at my discretion at um, in the ways that I do and I don't want to. Um, you know, that is that's something that is mine and that I own and um, and is certainly fine with me. If you're talking about a, you know again code switching for a certain type of a approval right or um you know assimilation I, i'm not invested in that um for the second part of this question because i did want to address that in students um creating social justice compositions in a majority white classroom uh and i and i think maybe uh, and i'm hope i don't know if it's shara um if i'm pronouncing that correctly i think this is a lot more largely 22 um students of color black students being in majority white spaces um, in general. So uh, again, I know we're, it's, it, well, you can't belabor this. First of all, um, one thing I think about when I'm walking into a space and I'm the only black person, the only woman or the only black woman or what have you, and I'm, and then perhaps it's a, you know, very white space or something else, but I, I no longer uh, think of that as if I'm walking into that space or, or existing in that space alone. Um, there are, if I'm in that room, there are ancestors in that room, my community is in that room, my good, good girlfriends, my, <laughs> my sister girl groups, the, 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 the people and the generations um, that sustain me. And so you might only see me, but it is not only me in that room. Yeah, <laughs> there's many, many people, multitudes. Um, there. And so I, I wholeheartedly believe that and that's an approach I would take um, you know, to anything in terms of creating social justice compositions. Um, it, that's, it, that's your aim, that's your purpose. Toshi spoke to us so powerfully about um, being mission oriented and what that's meant to her and her work. I, I think, you know, do it and, and understand that, you know, and which I think you would all, because somebody that's asking this question would already understand, maybe that's received, maybe that's not received. Um, uh, well or not well, I don't think it's a reason to not do it. Um, but also where are you connected and where are you, um, do you have community? Are you creating community? Are you, are you um, facilitating that? Are you fostering that? Because when say that re non well reception or if that non well reception uh, happens, you have a community to reach out to, to support you, to discuss even what happened, how you feel, any of that, right? So um, I, I know that I'm kind of going about this and answering it, responding to it in a, in a different kind of way, but um, that's, those are some of my questions and looking and you know listening to uh, this question. Um, but if that's your mission, do it. And I hope that you have, um, uh, you, you continue to create community and draw from your community because that will sustain you no matter where you are in the work that you are doing, what space, wouldn't, no matter the spaces. Thank, thank you, Asia. Uh, I think when you were talking about the beauty of African American vernacular English, I'm always thinking about like, you can tell which uh, companies don't have a black intern, but they're trying to use black American vernacular in English. Um, the claps are all wrong when they're doing like trying to do the clap back. Like there's rules into this. You just can't be though ain't this. And think it makes sense. Like we know we didn't write this because we understand what goes where, how, and the rhythm to it, the musicality to it. Mm -hmm. Darius, you you want to jump in about code switching? Um, I mean, man, Asia nailed it. But you know, I think the thing I would add, as a person who is a part, a uh, professor at a predominantly white institution, uh, new school. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, it saddens me that a student feels the need to change themselves when they walk into uh, an all white environment. Be and I say that because of this, you predominantly live in an all white environment and you have to be maintain the integrity of self when you walk into that environment. So as Black people, I know we've, we've done code switching, we've talked about doing it, and you know, our parents may have encouraged this behavior <laughs> and whatnot, but I think you know, we can let that go at this point. 
I think for me, after seeing a man die with another man's knee on his neck for nine minutes, it did something to me personally that even now, just thinking about it, I almost want to cry because I shouldn't respect you in the same way <laughs> after that. I should, I should look at you as a, as a, a man or, or a female or, or, or whatever it is that you are, a human to human. And I should, I should command the same respect. You should respect me and respect my ideas. And so I feel like as Black students, you need to walk into the environment with confidence, even if you're facing a white teacher or facing a, a predominantly white environment. If you want to do social justice work um, and it fits into uh, the nature of the class, do it. Do whatever you want to do. You're free. Don't let someone actually shackle you. You're standing on a foundation that will hold you up. And I can tell you this, as, as a Black faculty member in a, in a predominantly white environment, we're going through the same thing. We're, we're fighting the same battle. So you should understand that you're not alone. <laughs> you are not alone. When you see our faces, you should understand that we're fighting that battle too. And that should encourage you to, to be even more determined to actually express yourself freely. Don't, you know, don't let this, this country take away or some environment uh, make you feel inferior or less than. Don't allow it to happen. Don't entertain it, like block it out your mind and walk into those environments free and alive like you would wake up every morning. Thank you. I feel like I might need to give a collection here, y'all preaching to us today. Maybe I'll just throw some ties in there. I think for our last question, I'm going to kind of combine three questions. And so you, whatever your spirit tells you, um, you can you can respond to. First one is, how can we imagine the future? What is the future for jazz? What is the legacy we are leaving? Um, we have a question from the audience. It says, how would you continue to spell community spread? not spell, spread community beyond the pandemic. And the last question is, do you think we can create jazz without patriarchy within capitalism? I think there's some ties between all three of those questions. So that's why I gave them to you all at the same time. Well, um, one, I, I think it's for the artists, you know, so that, uh, you know, that where, you know, jazz, with the future of jazz and where it's going, you know, that is, is you have to center the artists in that. So that is not, uh, I, you know, I'm not a jazz artist. That is not for me to determine, right? I um, am more trying to make sure that all um, have access, right, to this art form, that they have the resources, you know, as an educator. But, you know, I think I would, I, you know, I defer to Darius on that part of the question because I think, you know, the art form is up to the artist, right? Um, now this question, ooh, the do we think we can create jazz without patriarchy without, with it? Ooh, well, and that's in the last, how am I answer that in the last few minutes? But well, I will say this, framing it back again with um, Black feminism, because Black feminism is pointing to, you know, these, these intersectional, I, um, um, existences, right, of, 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 you know, multiple, experiencing multiple oppressions, right, at the same time due to gender, due to race, due to class, right, um, you know, due to sexuality as well, in, you know, and on and on. And, and so, but also understanding that all of those things are created by the same system, right, and that system is imperialist white supremacist patriarchy to you know really name names there so a, a capital you know and, and then that and capitalism is within that structure too so i you know that's um i feel like that's more of like a, a you know speaking of olivia butler that like that is this question is taking us you know even more forward but i think that is a question that has to be asked 
Um, and do I have complete answers for that right now? But I think not, not completely, but I will say sometimes, um, you know, the questions are more important than the answers. So I'm glad that that question was, at, was asked. Um, yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> Black music will live forever, <laughs> period. It's just like jazz is Black music. Black music is, was here before uh, we started calling it jazz music or any kind of music. And it will be here long after me and, you know, and everybody else who's present. It will be here. It will exist. It will grow and be more powerful and more um, enduring as long as we are conscious. I, I feel like if we're going to build on the idea of principles and, and uh, experimentation and the idea of community and, ex and, and inclusion, not only musically, but from the standpoint of socially and uh, from the standpoint of uh, identity, challenging all of those concepts, jazz and the, and the whole community has, it can only grow. Because think about this, there's a lot of things that we haven't seen in jazz, a lot. <laughs> like I could just <laughs> name them, but it's like, I'm excited about seeing a non-binary person on the cover of Downbeat. I'm I'm like- Can we have that, please? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, you know, there's a lot of things that just don't exist. Like, we, it's just not happening. Is that person not there? I, nope. You know what I'm saying? Those people exist. I, you know, I, I, I want to get to the point where that's not even something that's like exciting. It's just like, we're just checking it out. We just love it. One of the things I love about Michelle and Nicocello for years was whenever I went to her show, I love that I was walking into the most open environment. There would be old people, young people, queer people, black, brown, any color you want, sometimes purple people. You know what I'm saying? It was all types of people. How did that happen? Well, you know, she didn't send out a fucking flyer and say, yo, these type of people show up. She just lived that reality out loud and cultivated that in her spirit and in her community. And then that, and then in the end, that drew those people to us. Similar to what um, uh, Toshi was talking about, the Octavia Butler thing. And so I feel like that's the thing we must do. And to, you know, wrap it up with the patriarchy and, and within capitalism, mm -hmm. man, you can have money and not be, uh, you know, a douchebag. I mean, it's like, you know what I'm saying? Let's, I mean, you know, I, I really believe that we need to really rethink this concept of like how to have money and how to um, distribute our wealth uh, amongst people in a different way. I mean, I'm not sure we're going to see that in our lifetimes on the higher level, but on the local community level, we can actually do that. Um, especially in um, in the jazz community as a whole, because none of us are really making that much money in general. So let's just keep it 100. No one's a jazz billionaire? <laughs> <laughs> no. Mm Hey, hey y'all, I'm peeking back in. It's um, it's that time. <laughs> I'm the timekeeper, that is my role here. <laughs> um, I'm finding myself um, feeling like really uh, emotional right now. And um, I just wanna thank everybody like really from like a really deep part of me for being here today. Um, Darius, Asia, Tabitha, Toshi, um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and to everybody who asked questions too, I wanna to shout everybody out. Tracy, Shara, Caroline, Nicole, Adrian, thank you for engaging. Those of you who didn't ask questions, thank you for being here, for being present. Um, this is so important and this is the first time I've 
been a part of this kind of conversation in this sort of space. Um, so here's to more of these conversations in these kinds of spaces and other spaces and cultivating and creating our own spaces. Um, thanks Winter Jazz Fest, the School of Jazz, Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Um, I'm sure that there are folks from all of those communities and from all of our collective communities who are present here today for this event. And um, yeah, it just, it means the world to me and I can only imagine how much it means to everybody who's been watching to hear all of you share your experience, strength and hope um, uh, and all of the rest of it. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna, I posted a few of the tracks that we played at the beginning of the event because I forgot to do that at the top of the event but we're gonna um, go out with a beautiful track um, by Darius Jones and with Darius Jones or by Darius Jones and the Elizabeth Caroline unit. It's a 2014 release from uh, the record, The Oversoul Manual. This is track 11, sending love and energy to you all. And please check out Winter Jazz Fest's uh, other events that are coming up this week. More very soon. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tabitha. Darius and thank Jay. you, Tabitha. You were great. Oh, thank you. Thank both of you. Have a good night, everybody. All right. Thank you.